He has given the devil like a linear regression constraint set beyond which he cannot excel uh, beyond it. He cannot do more than what it is that the Lord will have him do. There is a surface area within which he can operate and then he can't excel those boundaries. And among the variables within this linear regression constraint set are time. Like how long can you be put in the situation? And also among the variables is how many iterations, how many repeat offenses can come against you in this regard. How many people are allowed to hurt you in the exact same way and for how long? And by what date must this all be gone? He will be the one, God, that is, to give the devil a restraint set, like in linear regression. And the devil cannot excel that surface area. He cannot go beyond it. He has to operate right inside that octagon, that square, that hexagon, whatever. He cannot go beyond it. Um, but we don't know what it is. We don't know what the restraints are. And so sometimes we feel disillusioned. But what is certain is that, like in Psalm 125, the scepter of the wicked shall not remain on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous should turn their hands aside to do evil. Okay, so it's, it, it can't just indefinitely carry on. But in the time when you are in that, you will feel cursed. You will, because it looks like a curse. The conditions that you are in look so much like a curse that you will think you're thoroughly under a witchcraft spell. It's clear that we can, what we as Christians cannot be cursed. You cannot curse those whom God has blessed. That's what the Bible has to say. The scriptures are littered um, with evidences of that. We see uh, people looking like they're cursed that turned out to be very quite blessed rather. Like Joseph, like um, David, like Moses, like I could go on. Like basically God's kids, they might look cursed, but we never are. We are just tested. But the tests would be so bizarre. Like it's written in 1, 4, sorry, 1 Peter, 1 Peter 4, I think. I stand corrected. That we must count it all joy when we go through trials of different kinds. I think it's actually 3. But then in 4, it says, do not consider it strange when you go through trials of different kinds. For this is for the testing of your faith. This is definitely for the testing of your faith, right? The test is the repetition of an old event that looks like you're cursed and you must consider it joy count it pure joy but you must remember it's a linear regression constraint, constraint set it will also likely be horrifically repetitive the same thing just over and over again to a point where you will feel like you are cursed a lot of times it is to hand the wicked over that are hurting you in this capacity to their reprobate minds when you look cursed the job there is multifold it is twofold on the one end it is to refine you to make you as a christian sanctified but on the other end it is to hand those who keep putting you in this position it's to hand them over to the finished state nature it is to hand them over to their reprobate mind it's to finish them off in their sin it is to leave them debased because they tend to believe that they have cursed you when it's impossible to curse those whom God has blessed. But like I said, the repetitive nature of the offenses that come against you will make you feel like you're under a spell. You will thoroughly feel in Gati. There is an, <laughs> some kind of a thing you must break with fasting and praying. You will have been fasting. You will have been praying. You will have been consecrating yourself, beating your flesh into submission, searching yourself to see if maybe you're not walking in sin. That's why your prayers are hindered. You will have done basically all that which you need to do as a Christian to ascertain you're okay. Given that there's no one who can't sin, given that there is no one who does not sin, you can never be perfect. So it is certainly, definitely not that you are walking in sin. And that's why you are being cursable because there's no one who doesn't sin, but you are beating your flesh into submission. You are guarding your heart. For so from it feels the issues of life. You are guarding your heart. For so from it feels the issues of life. You are doing basically what you gotta do. Working on your own salvation with fear and trembling, of course, with limited perfection, because you are human, fallen. Romans 7, you will falter. You will have the occasional slip, but largely you're cool. With Christ, you are consecrated, you are repentant, you are consecrated, and yet you appear cursed. You can't be. According to the Bible, it is impossible to curse us, and also the Lord, King, and nothing can happen. So no one, no one can speak and have it happen unless the Lord has first decreed it. So whatever you're going through, it's been decreed. It has been allowed. It has been enabled. It is about demolishing arguments and every lofty pretension that exalts itself about the Most High and hold into captivity every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. It is about doing all that to make doubly sure 
that you are not thinking in an ungodly way about your pain so that you don't respond in an ungodly way to it like ditching the mission you counted the cost of being a disciple at the beginning of your redemption you know that god said that the world hates disciples you're going to be persecuted many are the afflictions of the righteous but the lord delivers him from them all you know all that so you don't have an option to leave but you are confused as am i you are disillusioned as am i you're uncomfortable as am i you crease your forehead forehead at god on some how many times must i go through the same thing like god but that's just the thing the lord knows what strength he has given you and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able So this here trial you can succeed past it. Back then I had the uh psychometric test by Liberty Life. I passed it. Or I was approved, whatever the right word, right? I was approved after the psychometric testing shortlisted further. I then went for the final interview. And it's funny cuz on the day that I was going for the final interview, I remember I was standing in front of Liberty Life looking at Libridge. and my cousin had just worn my clothes muddied them desecrated them and not washed them or respected them and i had complained on some but the one oh that was giving me grief i was like why are you doing this like come on if you're going to use my stuff first and foremost please ask me and secondly did has what would you mean would you mean and when i asked this of her she responded back to me by saying oh ho kara bos ka tlong bora you just bitter and the reason why she was calling me bitter was cuz i was unemployed and in a lot of pain That's a person that's jealous right there treating somebody that they're supposed to love like they ain't jack because they're going through a lot. My response to my cousin just before that interview. Literally as I'm getting this text message I'm standing in front of Libridge. I'm about to go for my last interview. Um I'm about to go for my last interview. I say to her, I send her a text message. And I I respond, I say the only place that a person can go when they're down is up. I was like there's no way you can go when you are down on the ground other than up. That was my response. It was actually quite mature for someone that was unregenerate. I could have just sworn at her, like cast her out, but I didn't. I was like the only place that a person can go when they are down is up. And after sending her that SMS, I walked into Libridge. Actually no, the interview was not at Libridge, but I was in between Libridge and the main building, Ya yeah, Liberty Life. The 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 interview was in the head office, the main head office. I went to my interview. Got interviewed and it went well. It went swimmingly. The interview, I could feel it in my bones. They were smiling with me. They were clearly besotted with me that panel of about um 6 men and women. Uh yeah, interviewed me and it it went it went so well that I was confident that I made it. Okay. By the time I left By the time I left, I was confident that I definitely made it. And I went home. I went home. Okay. Yeah. Uh however, the amount of time that it took for Liberty Life. So, from the date of my unemployment to the date of me finding that article in the newspaper to apply for that learnership, it was 6 months. That progressed. I was somewhat peachy happy for like 2 months as the interview processes was happening were happening because they did take about 2 months right first it was the essay i was then called for for uh, uh, an interview on that was on the phone a telephonic interview and then within like the same week i was then called for a psychometric test and then within like 2 weeks i was called for the final interview it all happened very quickly the whole interview process lasted perhaps like uh, about 2 months like uh, there was no more than 2 weeks that would progress between being callbacks no more than 2 weeks that would progress between callbacks for the various phases there were quite a few phases okay it was the telephonic it was a, a, the psychometric and then after the psychometric there was some other test and then after that uh, after that short listing there then was the final interview and the whole thing took about 2 months okay it was quick it was kind of back to back i can't really say that i yeah and i expected that it would be about back to back because there were so many candidates and there was so much there were so many decisions that had to be made etc um so yeah i was looking cool and i was still excited and i was still bouncy and cool here guys Mm-mm-mm-mm. the amount of time it took after the final interview for them to call to confirm uh in akona they didn't even call us they they sent us No, no. They sent letters first to the um, candidates who failed, who did not make it. They sent them correspondence via mail. Okay. They first got to them. Yes, like it all. Hey. 
I, I had waited no more than two months before. Two weeks, sorry. Between callbacks. This time going to like three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks. Yo, it was quiet. It was deadly quiet. And the amount of confidence that I had that I made that interview, that learnership, it started to plunge. And initially the plunge was slow. And then it became exponential in its decline. And with the plunge of confidence that I made it came just this exquisite reignition of a severity of depression. Oh, yes, like it. I went, like after sending that check, that text on some, the only place that a person can go when they're down is up. For me to not get the job, for me to then be endured through that insanity again, like for me to just keep roaming around like a dust particle in the gassy, for me to just keep smoking cigarettes and drinking cheap wine with my cousin and her boyfriend when we can find the money for me to keep on buying workplaces. And I had also stopped looking for jobs in the workplace, by the way, because I was leaning on nothing but that liberty life opportunity. Remember, I was using my money for this and it would finish by mid-month. And then I would have to wait until the end of the month to get another 600 bucks. The 600 bucks of which I only got 350 of it. And then I stopped. Like I, this, I literally put all of my eggs in this one little basket and I was getting flat now that it's not coming. Yo, 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 square one. Square one, suicide ideation. Square one. Give it a And it got so bad that I was like, I, I'm going home. Yeah, I go at home. It wasn't really home. I'd never even seen her house in case it ends. But where my mom was staying, I was like, yeah, yeah. And the reason I stayed in Johannesburg is because I wanted to stay in Johannesburg. Uh, I, I decided that I'm going to take a greyhound to KwaZulu Natal and go to be with my mom because I always wanted her affection even though I didn't have it. Okay? I thought that home is where the heart is. And so I went. One day, just fell out of the blue after she sent me money. I used three. I used about 250 bucks of that money to take a greyhound. That's how cheap it was back then to go all the way to KZN. Kapas. Okay. Uh, I spent 250, got on a greyhound, um, and went to to Kwazulu. I went to Durban. Called my mom. She was irritated. I was depressed. The reason I went home was because the depression was so extreme that I was certain and I wanted to give my mom a chance to basically save me and I also wanted something inside me was like maybe they'll still call that liberty life you know maybe they'll still call maybe they'll still call so there was enough hope even though I was in a severity of despair to keep me going there was enough hope to keep me going even though I was in despair there was the pros- possibility that this could still give um, even though it was six weeks seven weeks what in the world like Almost two months into Lille, Levante, they're not like, uh, who, who, who does not call you back within at least three weeks after a successful job interview? Like, who doesn't do that? Like, who has that much time to waste? This leadership program, when are they going to start it? It's going to happen. Get guys. I was even having these fretful imaginations that maybe it started. Like, maybe that the, they had, like, clocked in. Maybe they've gone to induction. I would literally imagine people locking up an induction while I'm at home still waiting for an approval letter or an acceptance letter. I I, I was paranoid, like no man's business, but I just sat around waiting. I sat around waiting and depression, like I said, uh, it got to a point where I just felt like I was at the end of my rope. The cousin that was my best friend, however, that had neglected and abandoned me, I called her crying on some, I'm depressed, I'm so sad, I don't know what to do with myself. And at that stage, she's like, oh, Karab, I'm sorry. Why are you feeling this way? Please, whatever. She was mean. But I was looking for attention. That wasn't enough. I get on a greyhound. I go all the way to KZN. And my mom acts like, oh, Kiwang Bora. Because of my mom's reaction. I, I just Everything just got worse. Like it's, it's like the nail was in my coffin. Her reaction and her apathy. To Tabor, I was in pain. I know. That for me was like, hey, I'm going to get saying, Mona, what's the point? Like, what is the point? Yeah, I was extremely suicidal. And during that time, that's when I tried to drown myself in a bathtub. I tried to drown myself in a bathtub because so much time had progressed that I imagined there's no way I made it. There's no way I made it. And then, uh, after drowning, after trying to drown myself, and then the, uh, following the attempted drowning, or the contemplation with the drowning, right? I... I, I told you guys that I, I told my mom I'm depressed. Basically, I cried out for help, right? She then booked me with some shrink down the road from where I stayed. 
and she was useless. Um, useless. I've already explained to you guys that the only therapist that's ever worked for me was one that was using Christ. She was using the Bible. Um, so the psychology, really, the reason why it doesn't work 100% of the time where people need help is because they ignore God. They try to explain men's issues away through a very man-centered focus. And so that's why it doesn't, it doesn't, like, people just keep going back. There's just no real true permanent lasting solution but like I said the only time that a shrink has ever really truly healed me was when she was a Christian shrink yeah type establishment thing that lady wasn't Christian uh, she was just you know this this Indian lady could have been Muslim or Hindu um, that was trying to be nice you know but like she did nothing for me and I remember in the in the chat session because I told her that I'm depressed okay um, and whatnot and I was telling her my whole life like basically I told her my entire rap sheet and she was like, but what are you going to do, Karabo, if you don't get this job? Uh, this learnership, because I told her that this is, this, this is learnership that I applied for. And I'm really looking forward. I, I want, like, I really want it. And she was like, but if you don't get it, what are you going to do? You know, if you don't get it, what are you going to do? Because she was trying to get to the fact of the matter of Dabar, I'm suicidal because I don't have a job. I don't have anywhere to look. And I'm leaning on this learnership program. And she was concerned that if I don't get this learnership, what am I going to do? And I kept saying to her, it's not an option. I literally looked her in the eye and I was like, it's not an option for me to not get it. And she kept saying over and over again, but what if you don't get it? And I'd be like, it's not an option. What if you don't get it? It's not an option. Hey, I, I, I bet that shrink by the time I left her offices was like, this kid is going to kill herself. She probably got to a place where she was like, woman's going Hello. Hi. Hello. I'm well, how are you? Good. Yeah. Are you alive? Pretty much, yeah. I'm actually live, so I can't really talk. I'm live, as in I'm talking to people on YouTube. No, I live right here. I'm just outside the house where I stay. Uh, no, nah, it's okay, dude. Like, I'm a married woman. Oh, yeah. Man. You're a married man as well? Shame on you. <laughs> Shame on you. Black men. It's the thing I was talking about. Yes, I did. You have no shame, you guys. You have no shame. You have absolutely no shame. I'm a married woman. I am too. <laughs> I'm not really married, but I use this ring to tell men I'm married when they insist. Anyway, whatever the distraction shall pass. But maybe it's just men. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> no shame. Like, absolutely no shame. Guys, I feel sorry for you and the men you're married to. Hey, like, really, I do. That's why I lived to Tosso. Anyway, um, shame. I am too. Can we get a room? And we don't gotta tell nobody. It's just you and it's just me. And what we're doing here is private. I know you really, really want it. But you belong to somebody else. To both wanna be together. But we can't act on it. That's all it is. Death, loaf, Dej loaf, and Jacques. Anyway, whatever. It's the very thing that I keep talking about. And I'm dying today because of stuff like that. People expect me to respond to stuff like that just to get myself out of the situation. But I'm in Christ now. Not that I would ever have accommodated that even before the king. Guys, as in, whatever. Kifelitsi guy, the shrink lady. She was very concerned for me. She was worried, rightfully. I would be worried too. And by the time I left that office of hers, those therapy rooms, of hers she was probably thinking this kid i'm concerned people like, like because i literally told her in her face Uti, it's not an option for me to not get the opportunity at liberty it's, it's not an option like not even in the slightest because i knew in my heart that i can't take this anymore all right let me go back inside guys it's getting too dark and now the filter is getting too extreme So it's looking very much angry. I'm not a real human. So I get it in the room and record from there. Let me restore myself to the inside of the house. The power bank is doing wonders for me, isn't it? Because it's making sure that my phone doesn't run out of power. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Alright, so I leave that shrink's office 
but and then nothing happens nothing gives nothing gives nothing um suffices still for another like i was <laughs> i waited around in soweto kotlaidi for maybe like out of that six seven week two week waiting two month sorry waiting season that two month waiting season i waited perhaps like half of it go 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 so way to and then the other half i was in case it in and in case it in it was better because i was in my mom's company and i preferred her house and there was better food and 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 i was i had my own bedroom and it was just cleaner more beautiful like yeah so conditions living conditions made it that much easier okay the living conditions made it that much easier plus i was with my mom uh my my uncle was odd towards me my aunt my, my uncle was weird and my cousin were weird the mom was cool and so too was my little cousin but my uncle and her daughter and his daughter never were weird towards me so when i was at my mom's house i i was i was not as uncomfortable with me imposing on people's space or whatever i didn't feel like nekeba you know yeah um type set up anyway whatever so environmentally it was slightly better because of being in my mom's house but still the depression was there and the, the thing that was yawning and 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 just staring glaring at me was that i can next i can i'm seriously and i know my tongue too no but my mom was not even trying to help me hook me up with like a little call center job internship at her company no one was trying for me no in fact no one of my cousins had tried for me but i got a business connection where she used to work and another one got old mutual but both places did not take me cuz no experience and a business connection they didn't want me because i kept saying i was going to go back to school and for them it, they imagined me a flight risk and they wanted somebody that was going to stay um in in the call center pretty much wire wire and i kept telling them i'm going to go back to school i i'm definitely going to go back to school there was no way i was going to be able to go back to school full time only part time so they should have just hired me but they didn't so i lost that opportunity uh back then like i told you um the magnitude of people the number oh goodness the filter in able has run the way that it's kind of giving a uh, weird eerie vibes right now the um, Hi Queen Cat. Shame pressing you can't even travel the complex and follow me around because of some bully cat. Uh the right now literally nobody's trying to help me properly. But back then it wasn't nobody that was trying to help me. Some did try of my family members but like I said the the opportunities fell through. But they did try for me. Uh whereas now but she's never my mom's never tried for me. Okay. Now who did quiet and the one person that claimed to want to help me along on all these conditions there was a an ugly little fine print no 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 fine print that i couldn't accept me to take in my stride and she was like whoops i guess kunja lo yo i need to pee guys let me let me just go what's up i'm inside um yeah moving on uh where was i yes i was speaking about how it is that the devil when he is really ransacking the living daylights out of you he's going to use the same things that ransacked the living day lights out of you before he knows what's going to get to you so he will like ma- magnify the insanity when you're in Christ now i told you guys that two of my family members cousins tried to connect me with job opportunities back then but then they both fell through this time around it's no one but the person who uh, it's not no one the, the the one person that did try uh like i said khonale fine print and that's what i'm about to talk about eventually in this like discussion but you know we got to build an argument in the run up too yeah so however now like i said back then some people tried now nothing's giving because that's just the way that things get ridiculous when you're in Christ the tests that you endure or the conditions that you endure will be that much more haughty especially considering you've got the holy spirit so satan knows that the holy spirit enables us to overcome the deeds of the body so whatever it is that tempted you before to fall into sin is not going to just easily harass you now that you're in Christ because you are resisting you are filled by the spirit of god and so you don't just do whatever it is that satanic suggestion says that you must do but you can be hugely inspired to try again that which is evil to get yourself out of a an ugly knot precisely because of the fact that the situation is just so dire and i'm trying to give people encouragement to not cave don't give up don't slip up the scepter of the wicked might is not going to be allowed to, to remain on the land allotted to the righteous indefinitely just wait anyway the last place i left with the story was after leaving the shrink the therapist having told her 
It's not an option that I don't get the job from Liberty Life. I have to get it. She was all concerned with me. I think I might have seen that lady maybe twice. Uh, didn't really go back too much thereafter because nothing was, was giving. The environment where I was staying, Kukwazulu, was a lot better, like I said, environmentally, so it made things easier, but the depression still did not lift. I was still extremely suicidal. And then at the height of all of that sorrow in my soul, then... I get an, a, a, a call. I get a, a phone call. I don't get a call. My mom gets a call. Um, Ish Grand Cat, mainly distracting me. I don't get a call, but my mom gets a call from my aunt. Oh, Dulango Zamene, right? She gets a call from my aunt. Uh, I had put, in terms of a postal address, when I was filling out forms at Liberty Life, I gave the postal address for my aunt's house because it was the most secure and the most likely that mail is not just going to disappear in the woodworks just yeah you know because uh good lady it was i don't know like i, I feel like was there a post box there was but it was just less stable like i did not trust the mail box yeah good lady i didn't have, I trust mail to arrive there for whatever reason it just did not give you know reliable so i put down my aunt's address instead it had to be an address in johannesburg um and not so much my mom's address because how was she gonna get mail i don't know because she was in a different address what it was all the way in kwazulu Anazi. i just put down my aunt's address uh yeah my aunt gets an email a mail in the box in the post she gets a mail in the post and then calls my mom and tells her what's going on with the mail she opened my mail i don't know why she opened my mail it was a little bit intrusive but probably because i was in kzn i was all the way far away yeah and that's probably the reason why she opened it. But I mean, really, it's mine. If she was supposed to call and ask anyway, whatever. My aunt opens my mail and it was a regret letter. A regret letter. Ugh, guys, my aunt gets an email from Liberty Life. She sees the Liberty Life letterhead and everything on the mail. Opens it, says Karabo, Liberty Life. Everybody knows that I've been going through interviews and whatnot. Opens it and Liberty Life is like, we regret to inform you that... You have not made it. Yo, guys, my aunt calls my mom, tells my mom, your daughter did not make it. My mom comes back and tells me that I didn't make it. Uh, we regret to inform you. Yes, as soon as my mom said, told me what she told me, I was tempted to just burst into tears and feel like trash, right? I was tempted to burst into tears and feel like trash and just basically, like, I don't know, wallow in whatever that was. But I immediately said, there is no way. I literally looked at my mom. And, and, like, that's why I get it, guys. God, the Holy Spirit, Satan knew that I was extremely suicidal. The shrink was worried that this kid is going to kill herself because she just won't accept that she's not going to make it into learnership. I was contemplating suicide. I had gotten into a bathtub full of water. I wanted to drown myself. I then remembered my friend in high school saying that all suicides go to hell because of that. And then I'm like, okay, I need to cry out for help. I cry out to help. I cry out for help. And my mom books me with some shrink in KZN. I go see that shrink. That shrink then tries to like, you know, help and is all concerned because I'm unyielding concerning what if I don't get into the into the learnership program. Then just like a couple of days down the line from the last session that I had with that shrink lady, I get a call uh, from my mom gets a call from my aunt telling me that regret is a thing. The devil knew that I had been contemplating suicide until I went and saw a shrink that did nothing for me. And then I told that shrink flat out in her face that it's not an option that I don't get this learnership. The devil knew that I was at the ed end of myself. The devil knew that this kid is mine. This kid is mine. This kid is mine. Like she's about to get finished. Like she's, she's about to take herself to hell. And I am going to do everything in my power to make sure that she goes there. And he had worked so hard, ne, the devil, to try and get me to end my life knowing that this thing was, the, I was on the, I was at the edge, unlike other learnership applicants who, if they didn't get it, it's okay, life goes on, you'll get, get another job somewhere else, you'll try. I had life conditions that were such that I could not not get this, like, literally, it's like my life depended on it, okay? I told you my, my conditions, I unloved situation, made to look like some loser, some fool, you get my point, all right? I needed this. I needed this. I did not have sufficient support. I needed this. Yes, like it, like breath in my lungs. I needed this. Satan being aware that I was that close to the, on the brink of suicide. I was that much at the cusp of, so guys, you know, this whole suicide thing was so extreme that during the season, because I was as depressed as I was, I had an, a, a boyfriend in, 
uh, when I was in matric, right? I had a boyfriend when I was in matric. I wasn't a virgin at that time. I was sexually active. Some dude from 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 Soweto, okay? He was a player, 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 player. And because of it, I not because of it, just generally because that was the right thing to do. I I refused to out our relationship. We did it for like a year and a half. I refused to basically have relations with him without protection. You know how impressionable girls can be when it comes to their boyfriends. When you're when you're when you're that young, when they start to pull stunts on you and they act a fool and they are a, a sort of kind of what was the word that I'm looking for? Like passive aggressive. No, I can't really say passive aggressive. But when when they like when when they huff and puff on you and blow the house down, like a boyfriend that gets angry on a teenage girlfriend, and that's the, that's a recipe for okay 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 okay. Look, I, 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 I'm sorry, baby. Even when he's like totally wrong, there was a night when he did not have protection and he looked around all over for it and it wasn't available and I was like, I'm not sleeping with you. And he got angry at me, huffed and puffed like a little boy, acting all upset and then I was like, fine. Ever since then, ever since then, I was so worried that I was HIV positive because that guy was so all over the show. He was all over the streets of Soweto, all over the streets of Santon, wherever he could be, he was all over. And I had told him during when we were dating... He was like, baby, you and I, because we made it, um, we the, you and I need to stop using condoms. I was like, over my dead body, you're all over, oh, busy. I, for the first, I don't even know why in the first place I was with that guy, why I allowed him to cheat on me so much. But, you know, that's just the way that teenage girls are. And girls, women, especially in the black community, they just are taking their stride being rech. They're, they're just enough with being the main chick. Like, they don't insist on faithfulness. That's what was going on over there. So here it is that I am, we broke up, I broke up, okay, I, we didn't break up, we grew apart. As soon as I go, went to Varsity, he felt some kind of way, because he was a hood rat, and he could not deal with a woman that was studying, <laughs> you know what I mean, like at, at a higher learning institution, he was much older than, not much older, he was older than me by four years, he was 21 when I was um 17, that's when we started dating, Um, yeah, he was 21 when I was 17, that's when we started dating, so therefore... Uh, and he was at this stage now 22 so he was uh, a few years out of high school not yet and yet he didn't want to study he was not a, a, a particularly super crazy ambitious guy but i was ambitious so as soon as i went to university i i stopped being too girl I, I was a girl i was just a, a school uniform you know that was un- non-threatening when i was when we were dating that he met when i was just 17 <laughs> and then as soon as i went to varsity he got cold feet i don't know he, to him it was like kitomezang a woman that's busy studying at a higher level. So we bro, we put, we, what do you call this thing? We, we, we grew apart and that growing apart of ours happened after that, that day. If anything, that was the last time I ever had like slept with that guy. That day when he was giving me grief was after like, you know, some days, year, like weeks after my matric dance. And that was literally the last time that I, I was with him. Even though we were together for a year and a half, it just didn't happen again. As soon as he found out I was going to Vitz, he acted awry and a fool. And in and of myself, I was like, I suga anyway, that was not safe for me. So we just kind of walked apart and didn't really try to reignite again after that. Even though we had each other's contact numbers, we just grew apart. All right. Yeah, I was for I was like worried that I was HIV positive because of his hecticness all over the streets of Soweto. I was concerned uh, and I stayed with that concern for two years. Ew. It was, I was at that stage 20, right? So my first year of varsity, all of it, I was worried I was sick. The second year, all of it, I was worried I was sick, but I was not prepared to take a test. I tried to take a test. I went to, they, they used to test on campus. I went to the testing place. They counseled and before they could prick my finger, I was like, nope, I don't want to know because I just, I knew that I, I would not be able to survive a, a positive test. I felt like I was going to commit suicide. So I was like, I'm not ready to die. So I didn't go. I once upon a time also went to Helen Joseph Hospital um to take a test uh and I, I didn't go through with it because i just i couldn't i couldn't i was scared i was scared out of my crazy mind uh here it is that now i'm a hood rat i'm gathering dust just like my ex-boyfriend i'm a hood rat i am going nowhere i am just sitting with ashy knees in the gussy i don't have a job i don't have a career i don't have school i don't have education i don't have a future so because I was already depressed and at the end of myself, I wanted an, I wanted an, an excuse to commit suicide. And I knew that an, a positive HIV test would have been the one thing that would have made me not even care that apparently all suicides go to hell. Uh, that Yeah, so I went to Tlaidi Clinic because I, I was living in Kotlaidi at the time. I went to Tlaidi Clinic. I took that whole long dry walk. Okay, it was a long walk. I walked to Tlaidi Clinic and I determined i i was so depressed i was so depressed i was so depressed i wanted to die so much 
that I wanted, like I said, an excuse to kill myself. So this for me would have been the thing that would have pushed me off the precipice. I told myself that I'm going to finally go and test to see if I've got HIV because I've been worried all along since that boyfriend of mine. I've been concerned. So I'm going to go and I'm going to test for HIV. And if it comes out positive, this is the nice, perfect opportunity for me to just die. I wanted to die, but I wanted a perfect excuse for it. I went to Daddy Clinic and something that I was never going to be brave to do. I don't know. Like if my life never fell apart, I don't even know if I would have ever tested. Y'all, I was so scared. I was so I was just going to wait to manifest symptoms if I was sick. Yeah, because I just didn't want to know. Mm. But I went and this time around, instead of... uh leaving before the counselors prick my finger uh because they first counsel you and are like what are you gonna do if you if you are positive are they yeah pre by what do they call it pre testing counseling that thing yeah i always walked out when they said are you sure i i always left this time around i went all the way in i finished the journey of testing for hiv hey <laughs> garabo was prepared to die I wanted it. I didn't even know how I was going to do it. All I knew was that I was going to find a way to do it. I was, if I had tested positive, I was going to die. Guys, despite the fact that at the top of my brain, I kept hearing over and over again what my friend said. Suicides go to hell. I was going to kill myself and go to hell. Not because I tested positive for HIV, but because I was already just crazy depressed. And I had nothing to look forward to in life. And HIV would have just been the thing to push me over the edge. I tested and it came back negative and it helped. That, that's why I get it, guys. You know what? God, I, I wasn't supposed to turn 20. I wasn't supposed to turn even 15. I wasn't supposed to turn 30. And I certainly wasn't supposed to turn 40. I, I just was not supposed to live to an, uh, a mature age. I was supposed to be a young death, even child death. Like, anyway, whatever. It comes out negative and ew, guys, on the day when I tested for the first time ever for HIV, I was so happy. And I was happy, but I was still very depressed. But I was very happy because I was worried about this thing for two years. I was really worried about this thing for two years, but I was happy. It, it gave me peace and it made me feel like, okay, so maybe I do have a future. Maybe I'm going to get married. I'm going to have children and I'm gonna, I've got a clean bill of health. Okay. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to keep me happy. I still had all these other factors encircling me. But coming up negative certainly did rescue my life. For then. Okay? It did rescue my life. So what I'm trying to explain is that this, this, like, Satan knew that I was on my way out. The devil knew. I, if I had tested positive for HIV, I am telling you right now, today I wouldn't be alive. I was determined to kill myself in spite there was that was the only thing that, that would have successfully pushed me off the edge in spite of the fear that i might have had that i could go to hell uh, so uh, that day in the bathtub i i you know i didn't have enough like you know like yeah the threat of hell worked because i was with a clean bill of health i was an hiv positive blah 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 the devil knowing those things Knowing what this person is almost mine, like Punyuga Mampete, that's what I was to him. I was like, you know, butterfingers, like something that just kind of slips through his fingers. I, I was almost in his grasp so many times, starting from the age of 11. He just knew that this opportunity, if it falls through, then she's not going to make it. But you see, the devil, here in lines, here in last again, this linear regression constraint set that I keep on talking about, where it is that God gives the devil a set of constraints within which to test or to tempt his christians and he can't they can't go any further job i wasn't christian at the time but i was called right i was gonna be his job god said have you considered my servant job and then the devil was like he will mess he, he will mess up his faith with you if you take everything away from him and god was like take everything away from him but don't take his life you see there's the linear regression constraint said you can take his children you can take his livestock you can take his cloud you can take his wealth you can take his home you can just take it all but you cannot kill him the second time he was told you can give him a sickness a disease a body scratching he had sores all over his body you know scraping them with broken pottery yeah but then God told the devil, you can do that to him. Give him a pestilence, but not a life-threatening one. You can't kill him. You cannot kill him. That is applicable to us all. The Lord is the one that determines how much the devil can do to you. So Satan cannot cause where, like a, a job interview to be unsuccessful. Just because he infiltrated the mind of a person or made your CV disappear by magic or caused something. Like if at all you are supposed to get a job, Satan cannot not 
He cannot stand in front of that, but he can create an illusion of the loss of that job. He can create an illusion. He can, he, he's, he's given, stumbled, like if God says that God was going to work for liberty life, the devil will create a severity of despair by causing old mutual and business connection and all the call centers of South Africa and all the people that could hook you up with a job to basically try for you, but it all falls through. Like enough failed events around the main one that would make you now basically imagine even the main one is potentially just going to fall through. Yeah, type thing. But if that main one is the one that has been in incubated, ensconced by God to not fall through, Satan can't touch it. You know, it's written in God's word that he opens doors that no one can close and closes doors that no one can open. In that letter to the church at Laodicea and elsewhere across in the scriptures, it is clear that, you know, no one can speak and have it happen unless the Lord has first decreed it. Satan is within a linear regression constraint set, not only for the righteous, but even for the lost, because the lost at some point, some of them do get found. So the, the life events, the providential life events encircling a saint providentially, well, a future saint prov providentially, will be such that Satan uh, cannot just run free reign around them you know, blocking them from ultimately walking in their promise. God gives explicit, clear instructions. This is how much he can do and no more. And Satan just, he cannot just exceed past that. He does not have an option to do so. He cannot just disobey that. He's not going to win. Do you understand? He will get stopped dead in his tracks. And if at all he decides to leave that first estate, he will then be bound in chains, which is not pro 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 prophesied about him. So he is unlikely going to do that type thing. Not unlikely he can't because then, you know, what happens to fallen angels when they decide to just go out of their first estate is they get bound in chains. But Satan has a job for the future. You got to fill the Antichrist and all that jazz. So he doesn't do that. Neither do his minions, the demons, for the other fallen angels. They, they cannot excel beyond what has been given them by God as you can do this much and not more. Okay? Including for unbelievers. All right? The common grace of God falls all over creation. It, it falls on everything. Us all. We, rain falls on the righteous and the wicked. All of us. Are given protections by God ubiquitously his common grace is applicable and his common grace was an application an application in my life before I came to him in a very clear sense so something that was a door that God opened Satan could not shut that but he could certainly create an optical illusion of a door being shut he knew so much that I was so suicidal that he literally went out of his way to create that as an illusion and remember I'm not saved I'm not born again it would be years before I get saved I got saved eventually at 26 and a half I'm just 20 it would be a uh, half a decade that would pass first before I even start to look at the things of God from that date um and yet the spirit of God spoke either it was God's spirit or ministering angels you know evidencing that we are literally called from inside our mother's wombs we are called predestinated eternity past because events are so miraculous around those who ultimately walk in Christ that they can I mean the stories that they tell of their lives prior to the Lord you see the fingerprint of Jesus it's not like they were just left they were obviously not just left they were 19 they were one of the 99 out there that God went to go and fetch my sheep hear my voice and I lead them out and they follow me when event in like inevitably they come home and you see those that eventually come home when you listen to their life stories you see god's fingerprint literally just everywhere they're not just left they try to commit suicide and they don't die they are this thing that bounces back man like uh you know at the, um, the at the arcade there is this like little dolly poppy thing that you can like whammy with a hammer and it just like stands back erect again and just dangles on the spot a little bit and then you whammy it again and you whammy it again and you whammy it again or even the, the, those little popikis that pop out at the arcade as well and you hit them and then one pops up in that corner you hit them you hit them and as many as you hit as then uh, as many points as you get and then you get a little teddy bear at the end if you've hit enough of them yeah the person called in christ is like those 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 little popikis that you keep on whammying with a hammer and they just bounce back you know 